Hi, good afternoon, and welcome to the Catapult Virtual Lockdown Salon program. And this is Tony Bethel Bennett. I'm sitting in the sunny yet breezy Nassau, Bahamas. This afternoon, I will be in discussion with Lysandra Surreal from St. Martin. Before we begin, I'd like to express, express huge thanks to the Catapult partners, including the American Friends of Jamaica, Kingston Creative, and Fresh Milk for making this series of salons happen. Please feel free to ask your questions in the comment section during the talk, which we'll get to in the Q&A segment of the salon. And subscribe to the Fresh Milk YouTube channel. And here we go to Lisandro. Welcome, Lisandro. Good to have Hi. you here today. Hi, yeah. Hi, thank you for having me. Well, it's a pleasure. How's yes. it going? Good, good. Nice and sunny here, but we promised you wouldn't talk about the weather today. There you go. You know, we have an oyster <laughs> here, so it's slightly different. But I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about yourself to begin with so that we can get familiar with you and then we can move on from there. Okay, well, yes. My name is Lisandro Surial. I'm an artistic researcher photographer from um, St. Martin. Um, very small island, binational island in the Dutch, French, Caribbean. Um, it has this, a very complex colonial history. And I, of a person of this kind of place of overlapping histories, am trying to navigate my um, kind of lost history and identity in that um, historical, cultural fabric. Um, so that is what my work tries to explore. Um, where I'm from, a lot of people don't have, yeah. So you oh, bring up a good point. And, and, and yeah. it's, the, it's the conflicting, the erasing of history that one history has over another. So you have the, a collision in some ways, but you also have a, a yes. blending. Yes, yes. And that is a blessing, but also... Uh, it's something we have to navigate very carefully because my, my work is rooted in the fact that I do not know things. And I'm not afraid to admit that I do not know things. Um, I think in the depths of our past, looking beyond a certain point where we often have no idea because we do not know our ancestors by name. Um, we do not know where they come from directly. Often you have to look for unconventional, uninstitutionalized methods for coming into contact with that kind of history and knowledge. And that is what my work essentially, in bottom line, is trying to seek out. So that is a little about my work more than me, but it's a great point to start. <laughs> and how does it feel to be caught up in this kind of work? Because our work says a lot about us, even though you're saying that is about your work, not about you. but. Um, the thing is, is that I, in doing this project, the whole thing is just one big learning curve. My project is called Ghost Island, and it explores the black imagination of the Caribbean as a means or uses that black imagination to kind of um, reclaim identity, um, knowledge of the past, an alternate history of the popularly told colonial perspective of history. Um, finding yourself in that is not that easy if you have to rely on institutions that you've been brought up in. So it's kind of seeing the edge of the land while you're growing up in a fog, as it were. That's the only way I can describe it. And sometimes you have to feel your way around. And that's essentially my my method but fogs can be useful i remember mm. being a child in vancouver and having a fog so thick you could hardly walk through it because you saw nothing and it was a very it was a moment of like wow this is so cool how does that work with with the fog of being in this deeply colonized space and the institutions that really don't want to be changed because you brought that up there, and I'm going to mm -hmm. bring it back to that point. The thing is, how I approach it, is you take what you can get 
from those institutions. You take yeah. what you can get from the fog. You feel around. You can see maybe two meters ahead. And for the rest, you kind of have to rely on yourself, your instinct, your gut, your intuition. You have to close your eyes and embrace the darkness of the past. Um, go beyond the conventional means of perception. And in this day and age, conventional means of perception is the way we've been educated, the way we've been programmed to approach history and see the world. So a way of doing that um, is rooted in very um, actually natural ways of knowing, very indigenous ways of knowing, um, black ways of knowing. Some people see things in a dream. Some people have a, a experience that they cannot explain that brings them information about their past or their ancestors or a certain circumstance. These are all valid or some see it as not invalid, um, but it is a way of engaging with the reality around you. And it is a way that does not rely on the validation of an institution to kind of base your identity on. And I think that's the most important part that I'm not asking permission to write my own narrative. Oh, that's a problem then. Because, you know, <laughs> our institutions want us to ask permission and then they say, yeah. no, you sit small and you wait to be yeah. invited. The, for me, the problems with institutions is um, it is very coupled with colonialism. And if you talk about decolonization, at least for me, I talk about deinstitutionalizing as well. Um, in the sense that when you have all this knowledge locked up um, in institutions, institutions kind of dictate what is valid knowledge and what isn't valid knowledge, where that knowledge is located, who has access to that knowledge. And that is very, very tricky to navigate. Um, and, I see, and you can see it um, in just the people around you and the way they behave and the way they approach themselves on the landscape, you can see that there is something that people forgot. And that is um, how I walk around my home in, in St. Martin often. I see very magical people that have often forgotten the magic in themselves or where they came from, or that we are more than that colonial perspective or past. But that's because we've had such wonderful teachers. I, 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 I say that yeah, very... yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, you know, in, in many ways, we virtually inhabit ghost islands because where we live, we do not live. Where we inhabit, we do not live. So we yeah. inhabit a space that we don't thrive in because everything is hostile to us in our bodies, in yeah. our skins. Can you comment on that? I mean, I think that's something that you're... Well, well, Ghost Island, I kind of created um, this thought experience, this world of Ghost Islands as a place where all the forgotten spirits, ancestors, ghosts, mythologies, folklore, ghost stories, you name it, where they all kind of reside in a space. And it's an island that I imagine that floats across the Atlantic and touches everyone, everywhere, right. and everybody sees it from a different vantage point. Some people swim up to it, some people don't, some people are afraid of it, some people aren't. And it speaks about the way we approach our history and that everybody has to kind of grasp it for themselves. So Ghost Island is an invitation to explore your own identity from your own perspective. Because I'm not an authority on identity on, or who should be what or what is correct. I'm just inviting people to ask the right questions because it's more important to ask the right questions than it is to get an answer because then you start the process of doing something. Okay. So, and I, again, I'm going to try to understand because I've not really had a lot of experience in St. Martin. I, mm -hmm. When I lived in Puerto Rico, I would hop down to Trinidad on the Airbus, Liat, mm -hmm. that I think has been slightly challenged of late, but my experience with St. Martin is limited to that. So how does it work when you are in a schizophrenic space with a line drawn down the middle that really divides lives? The thing is, 
is that I think St. Martin is just a microcosm of what the Caribbean is in its entirety. Okay. So it's a little crazy here, but if you step back, the whole Caribbean seems to be in the same jumble, um, from my perspective, at least. Mm -hmm. And that's why I created Ghost Island, because it's an immaterial place, a fantastical place, a subconscious place to root identity in. And I think if you root identity in a nation or by borders, you're again kind of um, using measures of oppression to or colonial past to determine your own identity. So I emphatically don't want to root um, identity in any kind of nationhood. It's more of an overall um, imagination of blackness or history or forgotten histories that overlap that I'm trying to find. Because the Caribbean has an entire complex history of narratives crossing each other, people going from this island to the next. Um, back to um, the days of the Caribs and the Arawaks, they didn't stay within the confines of any borders. Those yeah. borders were brought over from other places. And now again, with the, uh, the African slave trade, you again have a mix of lots of different um, tribes that have come here again um, that are not, at least ideologically speaking, they weren't divided um, by any borders. You have when slaves were um, trying to escape uh, in maroon societies, they would also not look to the borders. Um, so I try not to look there either. Um, so that's how I approach my, the St. Martin complex by kind of looking, trying to look past that. Right. I mean, I, I think Benedict Anderson says, you know, a nation is a, is a fiction, really. So we're just yeah. here because they tell us that this is where we must be and this is what roots us, except, as you say, we, we are rooted but not literally within an, a space of, of nation. And then with, you know, the Cuban writer Alejandro Carpentier, it's so interesting the way history continues to erase itself and come back, you know, the, the Los Pasos Perdidos or the Lost Steps. And then you go into something like you talk about magical realism, eh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, este Macondo, and the way life just goes on and on and everything comes back. But you have the decay and then you have the rebirth. And the, I always look at that as different types of resistances within the space that doesn't allow absolute erasure. I don't know. I, I think that is a perfect segue into the first image, which is um, Birth of Paradise, the, the yes. new world. So if we can yeah. have that hold up, please. We were talking about this water uh, <laughs> earlier. Yeah. Um, and water is a really important thing in the, in the Caribbean, even though so many people are afraid of it. Yes, yes. Um, well, the reason why I thought this was an interesting segue is because um, right center stage um, in this photo, you have the Atlantic Ocean, which is common denominator for everybody in the Atlantic world. But you also right. have, I don't know if people can see it, but it's cotton, it's balls of cotton on the cotton plants, cotton trees um, that is being held out of the Atlantic. And the thing is with cotton, I think it's a very interesting, very complex, controversial, um, even, dare I say it, way to approach the Atlantic. Because if you really take a closer look at the history of cotton and its genome, it is, you start realizing that of all the cotton plants um, that you have around the world, there are only four species that are spinnable cotton. You have two in the old world and two in the new world. And the thing is, when Columbus came um, to the Bahamas, actually, for the first time, he, the, the Taino people there gifted him with spun balls of cotton. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that this species of cotton is now that species that is so emblematic um, and has come to sound for so much pain and so much suffering in the new world and still most of the um, economy in cotton is based on this species of cotton. But the thing is, if you look at this species, it is a crossbreed between a wild um, cotton plant in the Americas and a, um, 
tamed, cultivated African species. Um, so you have this cotton ball, which is a mix of old and new worlds already in the, in the Bahamas um, at the time of Columbus's arrival. So what this does, it places the first African diaspora before um, Columbus or an, an Atlantic cultural exchange. So in the sense that this is why I depicted it that way is that the Atlantic birthed, birthed cotton, um, but that it's, it's a way in which we forgot um, and now we have the way of looking at cotton, which is not necessarily painful, but it is something that we can reclaim. And is in this way that I try to look for um, magical points um, in reality that need a little bit of revamping, but they're there staring you in the face. Yeah. And so I, I, what I, I love the composition here because it's the, the cotton coming up, but it's also this ghostly presence, as you say. You know, you talk about yeah. Ghost Island, but it's a it's a ghostly submerged body yeah. that then has the arms sticking up. And I wonder if you could comment on that a bit. Well, for me, I wanted to kind of depict, because um, uh, it's a spirit of a people that makes the project of culture. So right. you always, um, and in this case, you're left with someone anonymous because mm -hmm. they, you don't really know who, spun that first species, who crossbred the first species. You just knew that it took place across the Atlantic. So it is the spirits of people's connection to that water um, that birthed that process. And again, it was also given to um, people that came, um, like Columbus, who came to the Bahamas. It was people brought it wading through the water. So it is a gift. Cotton is a gift. But cotton is a gift first and foremost to ourselves. Um, and I think that's how, that's how I see it at least, when I um, imagine this image. Um, yeah. Cool, I think it's a brilliant image. I, I think it really does a lot with the, what Gleason would talk about, the submarine roots of so many Caribbean nations but not nations as in states, nations as in peoples. Yeah. And I, I yeah. like what you just said, because it, it brings it to a whole other level of what um, Harris would talk about in terms of celebrating the indigenous populations of the Caribbean. And mm. so much of that memory or so much of that history is just covered over and ignored by colonialism as if, Colonialism marks everything, the beginning of everything. Yeah. yeah, I think that is very problematic because then what you get with these with these kind of narratives of blackness of black presence in um, quote unquote the new world pre -Colum in pre Columbian times, and if you look at if you want to be even more controversial and look at um, Brazilian archaeologists, what's her name? Um, Nieje Guijan, she right. pushes that African presence back by tens of thousands of years. Um, so at this point, you get, you start that question of blackness and indigeneity in the new world kind of meshes into one. And it doesn't become clear that if you are black, if you are indigenous before or after um, colonial interception. So right. that identity, the identity in the Caribbean just became a lot more complex and everybody is a lot more overlapping than they thought because everything is even foggier <laughs> than it was before. So, which is also a very beautiful thing. It, it is. And I wonder if you could bring up the second image that you, that, that we had of, because I, I think it's a very interesting image of this spirit being mm -hmm. and yes, this, 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 this. can you speak to that a bit the thing is this image um is actually inspired by a ghost story that i experienced in saint martin um i was walking by one of the 
most haunted places, allegedly, on the island, La Belle Creole, on the tip of the island. And I was walking, because there's an old, abandoned, four or five star hotel that is like a wreck since Hurricane Lewis in 1995. So it was like nothing. There's like, if you want to murder someone, that's where you would take the body. That kind of energy is there. And it's like dead, at least the day that I was there, it was dead silence, dead silence. Like there was not a sound of, normally you hear sounds of birds, a dog in the background, a car, nothing, like dead silence. And then I'm walking along this old abandoned road, this dirt road next to this property. And it's all bushes, all foliage next to me. And I'm walking and then I suddenly hear in the voices, uh, in, the, in the bushes, like a voice of a woman that's humming and she's following me. And the person that I was with wasn't hearing it. And I was like walking faster because like, what is, what is going on? And I could start hearing the cars in the background, but I could still hear the voice of the woman humming on my right ear from the side of the bushes and it was following me. So, and it wasn't anything um, maleficent. It was a benevolent voice. It was a pretty voice. It was like, mm -hmm. I don't have the most beautiful voice, but something like that. And um, it was quite, um, yeah, it, it was an experience that stuck with me. And it made me think about what constitutes our reality or the, our experience of it and what is there to learn there about our past. Because why are we imagining these things? Because if you look in um, the broader context of our worlds and our world on this side of the Atlantic, especially, um, is that a lot of people have similar experiences and a lot of people are imagining the same things or there's a whole culture in how we imagine things. And I'm looking at what does that imagination say about us and what does that imagination say about our past and how we handle it and how, we, how can we wield that imagination um, to produce something like identity. So yeah, that's uh, this image in a nutshell. Huh. So do we imagine identity into being or is it that we just re, we kind of reconfigure it with imagining? Ooh, that's a very existential question. What came first, the imagination or the identity? Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, in some philosophies, the imagination was there first as yeah. an um, omnipotent being. <laughs> um, some would say humans were there first in evolution, produced that imagination so we can survive and make cultures. And so I don't have a, a, a correct answer um, to that question. Um, but I do know there seems to be some kind of um, imaginarium, a continuum of culture um, that we can tap into. Um, and a lot of it is forgotten, but it seems to be right below the surface. And mm -hmm. we need to connect with each other, I think. Learn from each other's imaginations and not cancel it out, not be afraid, not um, put it in the box of this is the devil or what have you not. Um, really engage with that imagination and learn from it. Um, that's what I would say is the most important thing to say about imagination. I. I, I want to build on that a little bit because I think that's really important mm -hmm. across the region as we go through this neoliberal process of disaster capitalism, um, green gentrification, and all of this that I see daily. And it seems that a lot of people just don't either live with it or feel it. I'm and the the physical space is being altered like the the haunted space you talk about on saint martin but uh, in in san juan there is a space that used to be obras publicas or public works which is down from an old airport and it's right in the heart of pretty much san juan and it's just really weird because I remember it as an active space as a young person living in Puerto mm. Rico. And now it's just being erased and re reconfigured with new road systems and hotels and convention center and all of this. 
interesting stuff that really just lays waste to the memories that inhabited the space before. Because space is so much about memory and without that space, how do you have a memory? Yeah, and that's, also, that's uh, I think, a quite common problem in the wider Caribbean, especially in islands that cater to tourism. Um, and St. Martin, you also see that, that landscapes are being altered drastically. I mean, if you look at old photo from St. Martin um, in the 70s and the 60s, you look at it now, you'd be like, that's a, how did that happen in such a short amount of time? It's completely different landscapes. Um, every time, every year that I come back, there's a new hill being carved out to build of what have you not condominiums. And I'm like, how? I don't know, to me, when I see the hills of St. Martin, I see an entity that needs to be treated with respect because it is right. an entity. It is a place that harbored the refugees, the Maroons from um, the plantations. It carried bodies over to the friend side when they got their emancipation first. So it sometimes the way on some sites are treated, I'm like, you need to have respect and maybe approach it from a, in, a, in a different way with respect um, to the map. To the map, because when you walk through the hills, because there's a hill right here, uh, Diamond Estate, Colby. I mean, that's where a lot of stuff took place. Um, but if you walk through it, you see this the slave walls. You see. Um, the old trees that were probably demarcators of properties, the same trees that um, our ancestors probably sat under and told stories. And I don't know, I think more can be done um, with respect to places like that. So, yeah. I mean, there are people that are doing things, yes, um, but I think more can be done. And I think it should be um, brought closer to the foundation of. I mean, if you want to talk about nationhood, I mean, I'm not a nationalist, but if you want to talk about um, national identity, I think that's something more to root it in rather than um, an economy capitalist based one that is based on tourism in which you are in service to the same West to which you were enslaved. So, and I'm not saying you can't um, do tourism. For me, if I see, I mean, I'm going, I'm jumping from topic to topic, but for me, if I see um, tourism, um, the way it's being done is very exploitative. And mm -hmm. for me, it would make a lot more sense to open up a flights or a network of flights to our African brothers and sisters and mm -hmm. welcome them. And then that way we have tourism and we have a cultural exchange, for example. Because in my doing this research for this part, I had to go to some places. And for, for example, in Brazil, it was a lot cheaper to fly from Amsterdam to Bahia than mm -hmm. it was to get from Brazil to St. Martin. Mm -hmm. It was super expensive. And they wanted me to go to New York and then come back down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the world for us, if you, if you talk about tourism and accessibility and who it's for, just based on that alone, there are problems in that. Um, so, and I think there's a lot to reclaim there as well. And it starts with the way of thinking. And I think that way of thinking is rooted in how we imagine ourselves. So, uh oh, yeah. we've been uh, you hijacked. You're back. Mercury, that's okay. You disappeared yeah. for a moment. Yeah. Um, yeah, but but tourism is just an extension of the whole imperial project. That's at least that's one of the ways I see it, because the trade routes are controlled by a particular global power, in a way that is not to enrich the destination, but to, ex as you said, exploit it. So when we plow down the we're actually killing ourselves in order to survive. Yes, and I think it's very ironic that of the entire triangular trade, that the Middle Passage is the one that's shut down <laughs> now, if you think about it. It's very ironic. And nobody asks these questions. Like I'm like, where, why, why is that shut down? Planes can't fly. Like I don't know. It's uh, it's yeah. I don't know. It's, it sometimes makes me really angry when I think about these things, and I feel like in my lifetime I want to start an airline just to have that <laughs> connection. 
or a, a boat, a system of boats that would connect places. But again, even yeah, that is um, problematic. The thing is with the boats, like the boat, if you get stranded on the Atlantic off of the Atlantic coast of West Africa, the water automatically brings you to the Caribbean. You don't even have to right. have a, a sail or an engine. The, you just drift here. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't, it's, <laughs> It's, so, it's, yeah. it's so true, but we were talking a little earlier about the quality of water, and I, I, I bring it back to that because there is a particular, as we were saying, a particular quality in much of the waters of the Caribbean that is not necessarily present in other spaces. It's there in Brazil, but it's very different in the Northeast. And that spiritual presence that we saw in the image just before is somehow linked to that materiality but dematerialized existence of water. And I wonder if you could yeah. just, just, just catch the public this. up on the conversation we had about water. Okay, so so I think what we were talking about before about water, because in this image, um, Birth of Paradise, you see how I see the Atlantic. This is how I imagine mm -hmm. the Atlantic. It is a crystal clear, pristine um, entity, body of water. Um, but when you go to other parts of the Atlantic, it is not the same. Like when I was in Brazil, it's also the Atlantic, but the water was very silty, it was murky. It was warmer, it was like a jacuzzi, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. But it was very silty and it was the Atlantic, but I did not feel at home in that version of the Atlantic because it's not the Atlantic that I grew up seeing. It's not that blue. Um, cerulean meeting the sky blue at the horizon. It's completely different. And they both have their own their own um, version of mysteries that pertain mm -hmm. to it. Like the silty um, waters that I experienced in Brazil, um, very magical, very, you don't know what, what you're gonna see. You don't know if there's something swimming next to you. Um, it is welcoming in its temperature for me. Um, you can, uh, you can almost sense the beings that are in it. You feel that it's kind of full of life. Um, as in comparison to um, the Caribbean waters, I mean, you go snorkeling, diving, whatever, but when you get out deep enough in open water, that clarity suddenly becomes very daunting. It becomes mm -hmm. this sublime mix between extreme beauty and extreme, extreme fear because it is so clear you can see you can see or not see the depths of that water. And in that depth, there are a lot of bodies of our ancestral brothers and sisters. And that is very, very yeah. haunting. So yeah. each body of water or each perspective of the Atlantic, when you look at it, when you approach it, it has its own way of haunting you. And I think that is why Ghost Island is an entity that floats throughout the Atlantic because no one perspective can speak for anybody else's. They're all different versions of the same truths or different truths of the same thing. So, right. Yeah. Or as Benitez Rojo says, it's an island that repeats itself, which is what your yes. ghost island becomes. Yeah. 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 I wonder if we yeah. can get the, the next image so that we can actually start to link these Images yes, together. I think Chromanti would be uh, an interesting um, image to look at. And no, not that go. one. I mean, that one is on. Yes, there we go. Okay. Yes. So, okay. So, where do I start with this one? Um, well, I can start you a little background name. Right. Um, that would be great. What, um, Chromanti. Um, means at least in the way that I chose to approach um, Cromanti, because you have um, well, Cromanti is very much, um, or the Cromantin people, was very much an umbrella term employed um, to kind of refer to certain um, black peoples that were shipped from the Gold Coast, and they were said to be very rebellious, very strong, um, Akan um, people. Mm -hmm. um, and in the New World, this translated into a very firm rooting of ancestry because people want to rise up against something that has oppressed them. So I think because of that reason, subconsciously, Chromantin became some kind of emblem emblem for 
um, resistance and connection to ancestry. Because in, I think it was in Jamaica, you have um, people that speak when they go into trance and they speak with ancestors, they speak Chromantin. Um, but then in, in like the bushes of Suriname, for example, in Suriname, you have a religion um, uh, that's called Winti. Um, and it's an akan based um, philosophy belief system. Um, and in there you have, because Winti has, um, is called, the religion, religion is called Winti and the spirits are also called Winti. Um, and you have like, from what I've been to, some in the comment section, correct me if I'm wrong or fill me up if you need to do it. Um, I'm not an authority, but you have um, Cromanti Wintis, and these are like warrior type Wintis. Um, a lot of these Wintis are associated with um, maroons and going into the forest um, to escape and to survive, to live with the spirits in the forest or to live with indigenous, other indigenous peoples in the forest. And not only to stay there, but to come back and attack and free others. Um, so, this image for me kind of embodies um, the spirits that dare to venture into the unknown, um, harsh nature um, that awaited them, but it still kind of embraced them and they made it their, their new reality filled with a new kind of magic. And I've done interviews um, with, because a part of my work, I also do interviews with other people to ask them their um, ghost stories. It's a very important part of my process, actually, mm -hmm. to ask other people, other experiences that is not just mine. Um, and I, I've recently done an interview with someone from a Maroon society, and I can do a five, 10 year project on that interview alone. But um, I'm very, always care very careful with what I share on open platforms because mm -hmm. information is not meant for everybody, um, especially when people use it against you. Um, mm -hmm. But there are stories, um, for example, of peoples that never, as soon as they hopped off the boat, they never, they fled from the boat straight into um, maroon society. They built, they, they were never slaves. Mm -hmm. So there's a line of ancestry that is, has nothing to do with slavery or the plantation. So there's already power in that. Um, you have people that um, chose or folk stories that Kind of, how do I put it? They were so fed up with um, their reality or their circumstance that they kind of spirited themselves away and they became invisible. And to this day and age, they still kind of live as some kind of immortal giants in um, the rainforest. And sometimes when people from these still existing maroon societies go out into their spaces, they see footprints of people, of large footprints of people mm -hmm. who, sh who shouldn't have been there because there's no one else in the area. So you have these kind of stories that feed an imagination of identity rooted in something else, but not only identity rooted elsewhere, but where that, I where that identity or that imagined identity, I say imagines, um, where that can take you because that kind of thinking or imagining moves you beyond the confines of a reality imposed on you because you can choose not to participate in right. current ideology in current um social political systems and i think that is again the, one of the very important things that imagination can do you can circumvent ways of thinking do things that are unconventional whether you can spirit yourself away or not you can always choose not to participate in something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's kind of this image, a ghost yeah. that's not participating. That's the, the summary. <laughs> and I wonder if you could comment a little bit on the, the foliage that you're, you're using, because it's, mm. it's interesting in that it's so textured and different. There's so many degrees of green and the, the, the light and the reflection of it? Well, I, I'm a, a believer of um, that the, the leaves have something to say, the leaves of plants have something to say. I mean, it's rooted in a lot of um, Afro spirituality and philosophies that there is knowledge that is held in leaves um, for medicinal purposes, uh, for divination, all of these things. Um, so I think that you can't talk about 
um, and imagination or um, how, reclaiming something without addressing nature because it, in essence, it was nature that wel welcomed us first mm -hmm. when we escaped the plantation, for example. Um, it was nature that brought us remedies for certain things. It was nature that nature in its way kind of um, feeds the imagination in a way because it's chaotic. You don't know what it's going to do, but it's a yet very structured that you can rely on it. Um, and I think that's where a lot of the, that, I don't know how to say it, um, but for me, the natural world or nature does not go uncoupled from um, black imagination. Right. But especially if you look at um, African philosophies, a lot of it is about harmonizing with the earth, essentially. So the earth is always point and center in any um, black philosophy or mm -hmm. um, imagining. So you will always find nature in my work. Something we're well, I think it's it's I think it's fabulous. I, I love the different leaves that you know, I I think this is a cane leaf. I think these are all some bananas. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is how do you decide or how did you decide here to bring all of these together in in conversation or in in speech? In this in, uh, the semiotics of speaking. In the yeah, semiotics of, of being, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is what it was, um, to, was talking about to you briefly off record before we went live, is that um, my, um, the way I express my, what I have to say is falls in the realm of magic realism, mm -hmm. um, of finding a magic in reality. Um, it, and my working method is somewhat surreal, based in surrealism in that it, kind of explores the subconscious. Because when you talk about imagination, you're talking about a logical associations that your brain makes right. um, based on your cultural background, your environment. Or so that's why for me and my work is very important for me to do things on location. I could do certain things in a studio, yes, to a certain degree, but there's this magic and chaos that I kind of need or feed off of from the environment because things in the space start speaking to me, it starts, um, I want, I don't know, I see a certain leaf has a certain shape, I have to put it together. It's a very subconscious process, I can't explain it, but it seems mm -hmm. so logical at the same time. And it is something that I ask myself, do I take credit for it or not? Because it's something that the space does in and of itself. Right. I kind of let right. the space breathe. And I think, um, yeah, it's, it's not, I don't want to go against the space. I'm looking to harmonize with it. And that is how I try that to get to where I'm getting in my images. It is the harmony in the space that I'm looking for. Exactly. And that was the word I was hoping you were going to come to. <laughs> but just a reminder to get questions for people, please ask a few questions in the comment section and we will come to those. But before we come to questions, I wanted you to go to the image that we saw immediately before this one with the being on the shore. Yeah. And I think that speaks to what you were just saying or, or demonstrates yeah. what you were just saying. Yeah, yes. Ultimate harmony for me, one of my favorite spots um, in St. Martin. Um, it's the Atlantic side, because the Martin has two sides, as the Atlantic side and the Caribbean side. Um, we're smack in the middle of two seas and two nations. Um, so for me, this is the, the Atlantic side that you see here. It's a lot rougher. It's a lot more dangerous. It's a lot more daunting, um, right. at least the way I experience it. And I want to kind of capture there, capture um, how haunting it is looking back on that ocean. Um, that is... Um, both mysterious, um, it, it brought you there, but it could also break you. And, and, and that's what that coastline um, kind of says to me, that it's, it's, a, it's, we, it, it's actually very magical that we're able to be here on so many levels if you look beyond just the history of um, Chateau Swayze. Mm -hmm. So and this is that feeling that I wanted to um, invoke 
or evil with myths and sages of Western yeah. And again, it brings up ideas of candomblé for me. And I am sure that there is a lot of continuity uh, across the African uh, sphere of spirituality. But mm. can you speak to that a bit, please? That whole airiness of, of candomblé. I know it may not be that at all, but it just has these whiffs. Well, I'm happy that you see that. Um, well, uh, the Atlantic with the ocean is often um, associated with Yamanja, who is the mm -hmm. mother being of everyone, especially of um, the people that traverse the, the, mis the Middle Passage. Um, and this image, um, to me, is I didn't depict Yamanja to me. Um, I more um, depicted an encounter with her and the sublimity of that. Because I think spirit is something you can't capture on camera. You can capture an encounter, but you can't capture that spirit. Because that spirit, that sublimity is something you need to feel in person. Um, and, I'm, and I try to translate that feeling as best as I can um, to invoke um, something, to inspire people to look at the ocean in a, in a different way and to embrace it. And, uh, yeah. I think you do that. It um, when like we had Dorian the other day, and that really messes with your relationship with the the ocean, because all of a sudden mm. you have this thing charging in and wiping out people that the government said di didn't not exist to begin with, but there is a watery loss, and it really yeah, like I said, messes with your your relationship mental relationship with this usually passive but, space. But the thing is that I think, or I believe, um, I think you agree with me as well, that true beauty lies on the cusp, or true sub sublimity lies on the cusp of beauty and mm -hmm. danger. And I think that is what you get when you feel like you're standing there. Because you can't, as good a swimmer as you are, you're going to probably drown if you step into the water on that beach. Right, right. Um, yeah, and I think, but it's so beautiful and so entrancing to watch the way the waves would have probably beat your body to a pulp, um, but it's beating the rocks instead. Uh, but it's so, I don't know, it's, to me, that's, that's where I try to get with my work as well, that edge of danger, but in my research as well, because I often research things that a lot of people are afraid to look into, especially with this, um, a very um, orthodox Christian paradigm that people are afraid to look in places for their own identity. Um, that's a whole nother story um, that I can answer off the record for anybody who's interested. But um, to look in spaces that are daunting, that are very scary, um, can be, you can find beauty and sublimity there as well. And a lot of answers are to be hidden in murky depths. In murky depths, and that the murkiness is definitely the relationship with spirituality and Christianity, because all of these Christians are so deeply linked to uh, a celebration of other types of spirituality that they don't even mm -hmm. acknowledge. And it's a especially how we live in the land. responsible for their freedom. That's exactly also a thing. Yeah. A lot but of I think we have is rooted in yeah, yeah yeah. I think we have some questions. It's a whole so other hour. It's a whole other. It is a whole other hour. <laughs> but I think that's a good thing. So uh, if you can answer some questions that the audience might have, that would be great. Let's see. I hope if... I can answer them. And Jonathan has a question. What are some of the positive things we can take from? institutionalization? I would say um, the information and I mean, I base my research on information that comes from institutions as well, but you always have to look at it with like a side eye. You're like, is it really what happened? Who wrote it? But that's right. this research in general, but institutions have produced a lot of knowledge. I'm not taking that away, um, but you just have to kind of really criticize it just as much as you use it. That's how I um, 
would approach it. And just what are some of the positive things? I'm making sure I'm answering the question, <laughs> not deviating. You can take from institutionalization. That's a very hard question. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, the thing is, the positive aspects is that there are institutions out there, like the one we're using now, that do grant us the opportunity to explore ourselves. So in that way, there is, a, there is positivity in institutions because there are institutions doing the right things. Um, but institutionalization in overall, that is a bit dangerous. I, I, to, I like that. When it comes to basing your identity on that. But, and, and that is one of the Caribbean conundrums, is that we base our identity so much on an education that is deeply institutionalized and deeply flawed. I, I don't know. About, yes. Well, I would assume in St. Martin it's the same thing. But well, well, for example, I grew up on St. Martin. I have been enrolled in the Dutch education system. And there we learn in that system, we learn that um, if I remember my uh, elementary education and secondary education, um, we learn all about um, that kind of our own history started with Columbus discovering this and the Amerindians were there and they were a little savagey. Um, we learn about the French Revolution. We learn about um, world, the World Wars, the Boston Tea Parties, that is, important to function in, in the society we live in today. But there were also teachers that, and I can't say if it was um, part, supposed to be part of the Dutch curriculum, I doubt it, but we did get stencils from certain teachers um, teaching us about our own history. To a certain extent, um, not enough has been taught or barely anything has been taught our own history, but there were certain stencils that were given out. Um, and I feel like in those moments, um, those, instructors were kind of working with the institution because we were all there for education, but still deviating from the agenda. Right? Yeah. So the two things you just said that I want to pick up on, the word stencils, because I don't think anybody even uses that term oh. anymore, because we used to get stencils, but our history was defined by the American, the Boston Tea Party, you know, the American Civil War, all of these moments of deeply colonial overcoming that kind of define particularly the relationship between the Anglophone Caribbean and the United States. Because if you look, we are just, there is a flow if we keep looking at the water. Yeah. And there is this flow that historical processes that continue from Charleston to Bridgetown. And to add yeah. to that murkiness, I can tell you that St. Martin is very complex in the way that we are divided between um, two colonial powers. Yeah. Um, yeah. But there are three of them, if you count the United States, because the Dutch side in every way caters to American tourism, so much so that we have their voltage system we have like a uh, number plate that kind of looks uh, American. Like, so we're actually, um, ideologically speaking, um, we are colonized by three entities. I mean, maybe that's an unpopular opinion. People can comment on that. I don't know, but like for me, that's the way. That's how I. That's how I feel when I walk around. That there are three people tugging on sin, or three entities tugging on this island. For us, it's almost like the British just said, here you go, guys, we've had enough of this. You take over now and you do whatever you want with these spaces. And yeah. that is how we became so incredibly nuanced and attached to the United States. But hopefully there's another question. I don't, um, any more questions before we get? Raul is asking, Lisandro, by traveling and photographing blackness in different territories, were you able to enhance through your work the plurality of what being black is? Ooh, this is a very interesting question. Um, yes, and I was able to enhance it, yes. 
Um, but the thing is, is that I, I'm trying to learn more what questions to ask about um, my own blackness. I'm trying to um, excavate um, for forgotten histories. Um, I can never say what it means or what it is um, to be black. That is the question that I'm not even going to try to answer because everybody has to have um, that answer for themselves. Um, but if you look at um, if you look at like Ifa cosmology or even um, any kind of um, cosmic philosophies, you have lightness and you have darkness. Um, and the church kind of um, demonized darkness and blackness. Um, but originally it was blackness was supposed to be in opposition to um, lightness in the sense that it was where the mysteries were kept, um, which where the emotions were. Um, whereas um, the lightness was where um, manifestation and action kind of took place, creation took place. So you need both um, to know. And I think if you approach blackness in this way um, to find out where the mysteries are and embrace those mysteries, um, in that way I have um, enhanced um, my understanding of self. I don't know if that answered the and question. That is um, key. Yeah. It was most really important. For me, for me is really embracing being afraid, not being afraid to say you don't know something and really embracing that and using that as a strength. I, I think there's another question about that from somebody else that, uh, Deborah, mm -hmm. who I have not seen in many, many moons. What is the role of memory, collective and cultural, in relation to history in your work, in terms of how you get, how you get to create the images? Ooh, um, yeah. So as I was saying before, my work is very, um, my work process is very surreal. So it's really um, based on connections that seem illogical, very intuitive in the moment, but I know that they are based on something that I've experienced. And the thing is, when you make an image, I can um, deconstruct in retrospect why it is that I put those cotton balls in the water. Like, why, why did I do that? Why did I associate cotton with the water in that moment that I was there? And you can look back and say, yes, I know about um, the Atlantic slave trade. I know what cotton meant. I know this and that. I know all of that. Um, you, so those are very tangible um, cultural things, historical things that you can research, but there's also a layer of what a lot of people would describe as intuition, like an innate note, your body just does something um, in the space. Um, that, is a, that is a very surrealistic um, way um, of approaching it in your mind, in your subconscious that you're not really thinking about consciously and it expresses itself um, very magically. And I think um, harnessing that imagination allowing yourself to do things that seem illogical, but knowing that they're rooted in something very deep in you that transcends the space and time where you are. Um, I think that is key for my way of working and my way of approaching um, history and identity, the allowance of chaos and not needing a answer like, strong answer that's crystal clear but that's what art is because art poses questions i mean that's a whole other topic but artists pose questions with their work and they don't give answers i know it's, it's a, but that, that doesn't make it a very tidy conversation does it yeah no that, that's the whole idea <laughs> creativity is not tidy it, it's not supposed yeah. to be all very nice and oh so yeah. I, I i'm afraid here we're gonna have to come to a close and you know please remember to tune in again at 4 p.m ast this afternoon for my discussion with puerto rican visual artist maria antonia ordonez and i would like to thank lisandro this has been an incredible conversation uh, you've got me thinking it's it's great i'm sure there are more questions out there and it's really been fun um please feel free to uh, Ask questions, 
you can put them in the the comments. Before we begin, before we leave, I just want to say thank you to Catapult Partners, including the American Friends of Jamaica, Kingston Creative, and Fresh Milk, for making this series of salons happen. It's it's tremendous. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Lisandro. And thank you too. I had fun through this conversation. Oh yeah, <laughs> we should do this again. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Ciao.